Welcome, everybody. Thanks for coming. The topic, which was chosen by Drago, who is our host, thank you for bringing us on board, and it's great to have everybody here. Thanks for taking time out. Is natural intelligence and supernatural intelligence strategies from Christ's insights? How do you tell the difference? A scientist can approach this cloud formation and go, look at those lines. Look at the distance between the eyes, the ears, the nose. It's very clearly obvious that that is the face of Yoda. We have strong evidence. Some religious leaders might chime in and go, Yoda's a virtuous person. Why wouldn't Yoda give us a sign? How do we know that this is not something that we're just making up? What's the difference? And that's what this talk is about. There's all kinds of psychological biases that we could have against this. For example, two of them that could be right here. Maybe we want to see the face of Yoda. That would be the confirmation bias, or maybe... I'd oh. rather see Yoda. <laughs> <laughs> or maybe the group all believes in saying that's definitely Yoda, the bandwagon bias. And then we automatically think, well, it must be Yoda. And then we see Yoda. So how do we tell the difference? My name's Dave, this is Zia. We run a healing ministry and a coaching ministry called Uncork Genius, and we rely on the discernment between the supernatural and the natural. And this is a big deal for us. It's one of our favorite topics. We deal with this daily. The word genius comes from a Latin root, which means to give birth or to genesis or generate. And the whole point is what we like to specialize in is things that God will pull out of you and live through you that he will only shine through you. So there are healings and destinies that God will do through you. There's Genesis that God will only do through each one of us uniquely. Like having a baby. Exactly. And the key point that we'd like to communicate today is distinguishing between the spirit and the soul. The difference between the spirit and the soul may seem like an abstract intellectual distinction, but actually it's super important. One of the reasons why this is so off our radar, we don't normally think about it, even in Christian environments, is because the words in the Bible, even though they're prevalent all over as a theme, are translated differently and they're not much understood. I had this in my life as a core question. I just always wanted to know, and I really didn't even know why I wanted to know. And I would ask Catholic leaders, Protestant leaders, theologians, philosophy PhDs, friends, what's the difference? I knew there was a reason why would there be different words, spirit and soul, and I could never find an answer, but something inside me was burning. And I knew there was a reason, and it turns out it was the Holy Spirit telling me that this was really important. It wasn't until I met Zia about 12 years ago that I had a real boost in my experiential knowledge of this. And there were some other groups that were well-versed in this that helped both of us. And now we think we have some other insights, which we'd like to share with you today, that are really important. And it's key because we often ask God questions like, why am I not getting my healing? Why am I not getting my destiny? What are some strategies for an inspired life? Why can't I hear your voice? Exactly. So Zia had some key points that she gave to me that were like puzzle pieces that filled out the picture. And once I saw it, we were both on the same page. Years later, we have now are doing this with many people with a lot of success. There's a lot of testimonies to healings, and we actually see evidence of Christ doing healings in a variety of ways, and it's really fun. And anybody can do this. This is not something that's unique to Inner Healing Ministries, and it's not something that's unique to us. There's lots of people already doing it, but we have a particular flavor, and we hope you'll enjoy it and wrestle with it, and don't take whatever we say as gospel. Just go, God, how much of this is something I can incorporate? Put your fleece out like Gideon. He tested the waters with God. He experimented. The negative qualities of religion will prevent you from doing that, will present one right way to have a relationship with God. It would be weird to say that there's one right way to have a relationship with Dave, or if you have kids, one right relationship with your kids. You've got to wrestle with the ones that you love. That's what we did do, and that's what we're still doing. Mm -hmm. And we're convinced that this is core, and we just keep building on it. So the main distinction between the spirit and the soul is that the spirit is a supernatural dimension, and the soul bridges the spirit and the body. And the whole plot of the movie that we're in is to allow God to bring, as Jesus said, heaven to earth. 
And the main place it happens is within each person, from spirit to soul. Sometimes the word soul, and this is what tripped me up, it's translated as carnal or worldly. And what that means is that's when the soul is detached from the spirit. Some theologies took that and ran with it and made it sound like you're bad, your soul is bad, it needs to get a spanking all the time, and your flesh is always bad, and then the body's bad, and then sex is bad, and then you keep on going. That's not it at all. It's just that the natural has to come into the submission to the spirit, the center and source of supernatural love. This is all over the Bible, and Paul makes it explicit in 1 Corinthians 2, where he says, the spirit without the soul is not going to get it. It's like a child not understanding what the parent is doing. You mean the soul without the spirit? Did I say it that way? See, my soul must be in charge right now. <laughs> the soul without the spirit is going to be like a kid who's orphaned. Yeah. And every person has a spiritual dimension and a soul dimension. And that's amazing because we normally think in our everyday life that, oh, we're just walking around trying to get our stuff done. We don't even realize that we have a supernatural dimension that connects with God all the time and is never sleeping. And this is brought out in the scripture, to live from the spirit. I just assume when you had spiritual supernatural encounters that they were supposed to be these rarities. But if you think of it as a life that you always have, you can live from that place all the time. It's actually the center of who we are. And paradoxically, sometimes we don't live from our center. We can live from that place of our deepest communion with God. And that's what Paul is getting at here. And I saw tons of evidence, Thusia, on how to live it out. And other people, too. Oh, many other people. Yeah. But you were consistently living it right in front of me. And so what we're trying to do today is present the beginnings of a grid if you've never been exposed to it. Maybe you already know all about this, but for me, this was a big deal, and it opened up a ton of supernatural life of love, basically. Let's give a practical example here. Jordan Peterson is a clinical psychologist. You're probably familiar with him. He's on the web all over the place since about 2018. He's down the road here from us in Detroit. He's in Canada. And he says this. This is a pretty striking statement. If you know the addiction literature, and this is particularly true with alcoholism, but it's not unique to alcoholism, it's been known among hard-headed addiction researchers for like 60 years that one of the most reliable cures for alcoholism, and there aren't any others, by the way, regardless of what the treatment center people say, is that spiritual transformation is what does it. Now, this is something that everybody commonly knows with Alcoholics Anonymous and other addictions, that there's a point where you go, okay, this is beyond me. I have to reach to the world beyond this world. And here's a perfect example of it in action. What's really going on is when a person is breaking that addiction, they're reaching out for God's help and reaching into the supernatural. They may not always realize it, but that's what's happening. Interestingly, if you want to hear his discernment between the spirit and the soul on our YouTube channel, you can watch our commentary on his testimony. And that's linked below. I have a small story for my own life. Really, this is where X marks the spot for me on where everything began for me. About 20 years ago, I was a young adult, and I was also wrestling with this question. And I point blank just asked God, will you show me what your voice sounds like? And I was committed to experimenting with that because maybe it's my personality. I just really believe in wrestling with things to get to the bottom of what's going on. I knew the scripture, Colossians 3.15, let the peace of God lead you and guard your heart and mind. And I kind of grabbed that verse out of the Bible and thought, hmm, perhaps the voice of God sounds like peace. And so I started to listen to essentially what felt like, sounded like peace beyond really what my mind was doing because I also have an overactive mind like Dave. And uh, <laughs> That's underestimating my mind. <laughs> you know, and so I started to go on this, what I like to call a scavenger hunt with God. I would feel peace in a direction so he would lead me to books, he would lead me to people, he would lead me to locations. Often at the end of the story arc he was building with me, and I was really walking in the dark at this point, I didn't understand a whole lot, 
but I kept on going. And at the end of the story arc, I did know the Bible at that point because I was raised that way. And he would take me through a story arc and then point back the same piece would point me back to a verse in the Bible and would say, guess what? All the experiences you just had, and they were usually interconnected, is what this verse means. So he started to explain the Bible to me through these kind of undeniable experiences that I uh, couldn't have fabricated in my own mind. They were all interconnected and confirmations of one another That's key. And that, I believe, is what, and still 20-some years later, I'm still doing that, and it still works. (laughs) And with more high definition. Right. He's the author and finisher of my faith, and he's filling this book full of adventures that build on one another from that time until now, really explaining things about life to me from that point. And one of my favorite scriptures on this is... It's the glory of God to conceal a matter. It's the glory of kings to search it out. And of course, we're kings and priests unto God. And so it's our privilege as children of God for him to create these Easter egg hunts for us to get to know him by following his voice and getting to know that voice from not just an intimate perspective of, oh, I know what you know Dave's voice sounds like or my friend's voice sounds like, but also knowing that his voice has a texture and a flavor and it's full of love. And also the opposite, that any voice that's not his has a texture of fear and judgment. One of the reasons why it's difficult to discern between the spirit and the soul and why sometimes it's okay to use the same language, spirit and soul, people often in normal parlance will blend those, is because they are often integrated They can be interchangeable, but if we don't understand the distinction that we have, these spirit, soul, body, three dimensions, then we're going to feel like it's all just natural. We won't even realize that we have supernatural potentiality that we can access. I love this picture. The light is like your spirit and it flows through the stained glass, which is like your soul and shines on your body and your circumstances, which is like the temple. The body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. You can use this picture to notice that a lot of things, like a lot of different fields in science, will study the light coming through the stained glass and then falsely conclude it's the stained glass that's producing the light. For example, some brain studies will automatically, errantly assume that there's no who inside you. That's actually not what's going on. So if you can use this picture, it helps a lot. And also notice there's a question that we'll get back to. Sometimes people miss it. They miss what the Holy Spirit is saying to them. And this is often because the stained glass in some way is broken or dirty or wounded. And so that's a lot of what we deal with in healing ministry is narrowing down and letting God reveal those places where there are contradictions in the soul and letting God heal those places. And it's actually a really beautiful thing when he does, because then the glass is that much clearer. And people have accused a Holy Spirit model of being perhaps a little bit like emotionalism. We believe that while emotions are involved, if there's emotionalism involved, then it's probably from a broken soul that was somehow crushed. It's not your spirit. It's not your spirit. The same with mind structures. When someone is stuck in the mind, that's usually a protection against a wound that something that happened in the past or something in the family line. And so a lot of the things that we kind of can blame on the spirit side really are broken soul pieces. In Zia's testimony, she asked God to lead her from the spirit to the soul because that's always the direction. If you look at the lives and biographies of healers and saints and revivalists and mystics, they all learn to just say yes in the spirit and then it flows through the natural will, intellect and emotions and the soul and then to the body and the circumstance. And it's always that direction. That's what Jesus does. But a lot of environments, including church environments, will do the outside-in approach. And that's not what we want to do. That's not where the supernatural power and healing and strategy and destiny is. 
He's a great example of this, by the way, a few weeks ago in the Super Bowl. Cooper Cup, the receiver, who was one of the stars, he had a vision, which he talked about on live TV at the end, that God would give him the MVP and his team would win the Super Bowl when the L.A. Rams beat the Cincinnati Bengals. Great game, very close. One of the things that I liked was a commentary which said, he lives not for victory, but from victory. And that's a great little way to encapsulate it, is that you get a sense of what God is going to do, what he wants you to do, and then you say yes to it and you cooperate with it, and then it manifests. That's a really cool thing. Yeah, so I want to make one little comment here. There is a scripture in Hebrews 5 that you learn through practice the difference between good and evil the highlight there is learning through practice the things of the spirit just like in a relationship in a relationship you learn to know the other person and you know what they sound like and you know what would upset them or wouldn't and there's a lot of commentary like drago brought up earlier what does god like well i think we can all find that out personally and then it becomes confirmed in the collective Holy Spirit in the body. And we see that all the time because we have actually layers of prayer groups. We have the one-on-ones, but we have layers of prayer groups. And it's remarkable how many times people will have the same dream or same vision or same thing going on. And nobody talked to anybody. Somebody pops in and says, hey, I had this dream. And then somebody else said, oh, I had a similar dream and here are some of the details. And then somebody else says, oh yeah, I got a vision that's very similar to that, or I met someone. That's how you know that God is actually confirming the word with science following. Right. You don't have to prove it. He does that for us and he brings the increase. Notice in this picture with the spirit shining through the soul in the stained glass window, Because they can be so integrated, we might mistake one for the other. For instance, some of the things in life we think are supernatural are really just natural, such as religious practices that we're doing, which we're hoping to get God's attention, that God doesn't want us to indulge in because he wants us to know he's always with us. For example, in 2 Timothy 3, Paul says, watch out for forms of godliness that deny its power. Always learning, but never experiencing the truth. And vice versa, some of the things that we think are just natural are actually supernatural. For instance, when we interact with people who are suffering, we can be dealing with Jesus directly, he says, but we might not recognize it. There's lots of places where God is actually present, but it's in a disguise. So the way we learn is, as he was saying, practice the presence of living from the Spirit, and it's always that order. And I would assume that this football player probably had talked to God before that day. Oh, sure. (laughs) He had practiced the voice of God so much that he was highly confident and confident enough to announce his vision across the world on an international platform. When someone I know tells me something, I don't need to guess, especially if I know them really well. I don't need to guess what they meant. I don't need to guess anything. I've practiced that. That's what it really feels like to get in your bones what God sounds like. The image of the light passing through the stained glass is a great one, but we have a better one. The deepest realities that Christ presents are always personal, not impersonal, because love at the center is personal. So what's really going on is something like a family life that exists within everybody because we're all made in the image of God, who is a family. And there's a ton of dynamics in here. This is just one slide, but everybody all the time is dealing with something like a sitcom inside yourself. One emotion's going this direction, representing like a little kid. Another thought is going that direction, representing another little kid. So the goal is to co-parent those little inner kids. Something like a marriage. God's spirit and your spirit together co-parent the rest of you. Jesus talked a lot about this. He said he was the bridegroom and we were the bride. 
If we use this picture, it gives us numerous insights about the dynamics because everybody knows what it's like to be in a family. Practically, what does this mean? How do we distinguish between the spirit and the soul? One of the best words to use I got from Zia, which is counterintuitive for a lot of churches and certainly for my temperament, because I tend to live out of the soul, natural intellect first. And if you're going to the Chicago Booth School of Business, you probably too are also living out of your mind a lot. That's probably your talent, so don't feel bad about it. God gave that to you. <laughs> no, he just wants to be in charge of it so he can make it even better. Yeah. But the key word to unlocking this is the word life. That's who God is. God is the life of love. So now let's describe that life and discuss the difference in the sensation of the life of the spirit and the life of the soul. In short, the soul is like an anxious, worried little kid. And your spirit is something like a parent. Your spirit's not worried because it's connected to God, something like a covenant, like being married. So in the spirit, there's a sense of fulfillment. Shalom, or as you just mentioned, peace. When something is inspired, like music or movies, somebody's getting in contact with God, even if they're not aware completely or submitting completely. But anyone connected to God in the spirit is going to be translating something of what the spirit is doing. It could be just their spirit. It could be them and God together. The point here is you can look at this list and get a big clue. Oh, okay. The sense of going through this cyclical anxieties, that's not from God. He said, don't worry. The sense of I'm right where I'm supposed to be today, that's from God. Part of what we do in prayer ministry is people call it nurturing your inner child, and that's not wrong. But what's even better than you nurturing your inner child is to let God nurture your inner child. Yeah, both together. Yeah, that place of letting God nurture your inner child and even zero in on memories and thoughts and traumas that happened to release the gift of that child because each child, they have a set of worries and fears because they actually have a gift that they want to express. It's not that the soul's evil. The soul is actually kind of a engine for your worldly abilities. So the whole family can move forward. Yeah. Practically, what can we do to move it forward? Recognize that the spirit and the soul both grow by love. Now, this is something that's really confused in the church and the culture. What we mean by love is God. God is love. We don't mean something that's just one of love's dimensions, like goodness, truth, or beauty. Love is not merely a choice in the will, a thought in the intellect, or a feeling in the emotions, although it's comprised of those things, but we shouldn't reduce it to any of those things. Those are aspects of it. So we get the strange conclusion, which is true, that love at its core is supernatural. And that's perfectly consistent because God is supernatural. And this is going to be a surprise too. Love grows through nurture. It's like the scripture you just mentioned from Hebrews 5. By practice, Paul says, you're able to discern good from evil. And it's actually so simple, we overcomplicate it. This is why Jesus so frequently uses organic pictures and stories. It's like anything you learn with your body, like if you're learning how to be a carpenter, for instance, you can't really learn that out of a book as much as you would prefer to stack up 20 books about carpentry and read them cover to cover and say you're a carpenter. That's just not going to happen. Even with reading the scripture, you can read about the Holy Spirit, but unless you practice the presence of God, like the old Brother Lawrence manual, you're not really going to become somebody that understands what's going on with God. So try to think of it as organic, hearts on fire. Try to think of it as how do I get to know somebody? Yeah. So when we're trying to find the core parts of the spirit life and nurture those, it's going to come the same way as when you're falling in love with somebody. You're getting to know different things. You're getting to know all about them. And really, your spirit already wants God. Each one of us has, you know, that 
saying there's a God-shaped hole in all of us. Our spirit wants God, so accessing that desire and following that peace and that desire for God will really get you a long way every single day. You just tap into your spirit, which is already connected to God, and asking God, what are we doing today? It's more of a sense of directionality in love. That's really what it's about. It's not obviously about formula or performance, but it's about a love relationship between two people. And you might already be doing it in many areas of your life, but perhaps there's some areas where you'd like to see more growth and just unaware that maybe God isn't as present or in charge as he could be. And so it's a matter of going, God, I want more of you in this area. So this is really important. We use this all the time. The soul, in a way, is kind of keeping you back. Your spirit and God's spirit want your destiny more than your soul does, actually. But the soul is kind of like a crying child. You want to go to Disneyland, and you're bringing the kid to Disneyland. But actually, the soul is slowing down the vacation. So how do you keep the car moving? How do you keep on your journey? You address the pain of that little kid. You go into the wounds where the places in the glass are cracked or they have dirt on them, either by sin or brokenness. And this pattern is pretty powerful. It's been tried and tested many times and many healing ministries use it. If you've heard Zia's talk on inner healing on YouTube, which is well liked, you might have heard her talk about it there. But basically your father wounds are echoed in your own earthly father, your sibling wounds in Jesus and the Holy Spirit like a comforter or power through intimacy or something that's so close to your internal motherboard, you don't even know you have the Holy Spirit a lot of times, but the Holy Spirit never leaves you. So the point here as well is if you have pain or fear or any kind of soul disturbance, anxiety, pressure, emergency, dryness, usually you're going to be able with the help of the Holy Spirit to find the block in an early wound from your original family and usually that block or that crack in your stained glass will obscure what God's face looks to you somehow. So if your siblings, let's just say, were a bit stingy, I'm just picking a sin out of a hat, you might feel that Jesus is stingy. And you might not even be conscious of it. Right. And you might feel that you always get stingy friends <laughs> because your friends are really pictures of sibling relationship. If your father was harsh, for instance, this can be projected into boss relationships, into even the church you go to and what you feel about your pastor or what you feel about the denomination or the structures that you're attracted to. Anything that has that fatherly authority over it, you can start to see, oh, maybe I'm attracted to this same sort of person over and over again in a father figure. And that needs to be brought to God and it can even color the way you see God the father. You might see him as harsh or you might see him as exacting. And the same really goes with the Holy Spirit. And often the Holy Spirit is actually a special one in this case, because a lot of times head people can have a specific conflict with their mothers <laughs> because mothers can be really wounded in their emotions. And I actually had this in my family where I had a mother who was a big heart person, but she was also really wounded. And so I then projected that into my relationship with the Holy Spirit. And I felt the Holy Spirit was exacting and capricious and nitpicking and all these things that I was burdened with in my relationship with my mother. So this is reliable. It's extremely common. There are people that we work with all the time and I'll ask them. In fact, I was doing somebody last week and I said, do you have this wound? Because it looks like you might feel God is like this in this way. And they said, no, not really. And then later on, about an hour later, they were crying because... They were like, yeah, that's definitely true. And they didn't even make the connection. <laughs> right. So most of the time it traces back to one of these three and it's very predictable. Let's just say you have a really great group of generous friends, but you think siblings are stingy. So you never ask for help. 
you have this preconceived notion, so it may not even be true about the people surrounding you. God may give you, load you up with really great people, but you can't fully receive from them because you have a cracked stained glass about those relationships. So the main point is moving from the spirit to the soul, and we probably have all kinds of reasons why we don't think we can do that. And the key to getting healed from that is not to try to figure it out with our natural power. Whatever our problem is, including this very topic, we want to go to God and have God figure it out. So, for example, we want to discern God through God. We know love through love. Paul says, you discern the spirit by the spirit. You discern supernatural not with your calculator app on your phone. You discern the supernatural through the supernatural. And of course, you get to know Jesus by talking to Jesus. One of Zia's favorite scriptures is, My sheep hear my voice. I know them. They follow me. This is why we're really such helpless vessels before God. You can't really chase after God unless he's first chasing after you. I actually, at the end here, want to pray about any place where we feel like we're doing more of the work to get to God than God is doing the work to get to us. Because it's really important to understand and surrender that place to him where we feel orphaned in those three relationships. And that's a very, very common thing to happen to people is to feel like, well, I'm reaching out for God, but he's not reaching out for me. And that usually comes from a soul fracture. I was an example of what Z is talking about because I remember asking Jesus to speak to me one time. And he asked me a question. He said, how do you know the difference between what you think my will is and what it really is? He said later, <laughs> I have to tell you. So just starting with the fact that God wants it more than you, God loves you more than you love yourself, God is already there, God is already initiating with you is huge. I remember I was taught in various religious environments, you want to do discernment, you have to get out all these equations, 17 rules for discernment. I remember I did the spiritual exercises of St. Ignatius several times, and he has all these methodologies for how you know when you're in consolation versus desolation. I found them to be cool and helpful, but nowhere near as cool as just realizing, oh, God's already with me. And the heaven life is already here. We just need to tap into it. One note off of what you're saying, Dave, is God has privileged us with being able to pray with some atheists. Oh, yeah. And it's fun, too, because they're usually open. Right. Without fail, atheists have a deep father wound. And I encourage any of you, if you talk to atheists and do apologetics with them, one of the fastest ways to get them tied in a knot is say, do you feel about God the way you feel about your father? And most of them will just... That's the last question. <laughs> and then they're arguing with themselves. Uh, yeah. Or more technically, their spirit is reaching out to the soul. Being able to invite that person out of an orphan relationship at that point. One vision that I have repeatedly gotten as I've prayed over atheists is really an oppression that puts a person's head down where they can only look at the dirt and can't look at the sky. Hence materialism. Right. That's a big intercessory point to someone that is on the fence with God is they quite literally may not, may be unable to lift up their head to see Christ. And so you as a person who knows God can break that off so they can lift up their head to see God. And this is certainly not to judge atheists or anybody because many people are actually in touch with their spirit or God's spirit and are either not aware or are aware, but they use different language systems. Some are listed here. Plato's cave is a good example. Some religions in the East use words like transcendence and consciousness. Sometimes they just mean lighting candles and feeling religious. And sometimes it's connecting to God, obviously, to some degree. However blurry, just like the Greeks in Acts 17. But the important point for here is we can discern in any area, is God here or not? Is this something that is the supernatural love of Christ or not? 
And then in John, it says, you don't have to believe every particular testimony you can test. You do it by checking with the spirit. I just wanted to throw this out because it's not like this is just a discernment for church or when you're having a prayer time. This is something that's all throughout life because God's love is all throughout life. And then the last slide here is kind of an exercise left to the reader. If you're interested, you can take this spirit, soul, body grid, kind of a Google map for the dimensions of life and apply it to all kinds of things. And what I've found is that you can get immediate, elegant insights into many different topics which are debated and dialogued about. We're not going to go into any of these here because any one of them could be a whole lecture. But if you're interested in any of these things, just ask God about them and start with the spirit. For example, I'll just pick one real quick. What is the real church? Well, everybody agrees the real church has to be united in the spirit first. So we acknowledge that other people are in the church and there's lots of church documents that will say that. But then when we go to live it out, we often live out a version of the church that's from our soul. And that's kind of the drama. Chris Valentin talks about this. He says, the real church isn't united by theology. It's united by blood. How a family is. A lot of people sit around and disagree about topics over Thanksgiving, but they're still family. And so this kind of, if you don't believe exactly what I believe, you're not part of my family. That's a soul uh, debating with uh, another soul. Yeah. Obviously, there's so much to this topic and we wish we could do more, but let's put down the bottom line. If there's anything you take out about this, take whatever's helpful and ignore the rest. But the core of everything is that God's love for us is more than our love for anything. So if we can start from that place, instead of from all the other places, worries, theologies, religious practices, whatever it is, then that's what we found, what we can offer today as the quickest straight line to experiencing more of heaven on earth, more of God's presence. So thank you all for being here. We ran a little bit over, but we want to do some prayer time for those who are able to hang around. Do we want to record the questions? Sure. Okay. Was any of this helpful? objectionable, heretical, ridiculous, humorous. <laughs> we left everybody confused, I think. <laughs> or hopefully chewing. Yeah, trying to synthesize, because as you're speaking, I think it points to the way I hear it is this built-in sense of knowing is different than the kind of knowing that uses language and thinking um, almost like let me give two analogies and then I want to see what you think about that. So let's say back on like the logic layer, there's something called a, a category error. If I ask the question, is this banana happy or sad? I ask that question, but the category of happy and sad doesn't apply to a banana. It just doesn't make sense. Like the language fails. So I interpret that sometimes our questions that you're saying about knowing the supernatural, maybe there's some sort of category error where we're using the wrong tool and then secondly, the other way I'm hearing it is fundamentally, we all know what relationship means or connection. Like if you say connection, we intuitively know and understand what that means. but We can't actually describe it because if I say, well, what is the definition of a relationship? You might say, well, it's a form of a connection. Well, what's a connection? Well, it's a so it, it almost like you get stuck in this thing, but ultimately, you know. So is that a fair way to describe what you're talking about that is just opening up to this internal knowledge, which is at the spirit layer. And then you get the peace. Zia, you mentioned that you experience it as the peace. And so you have this internal knowledge. And when you feel that, that peace feeling in your chest and your gut, but that's kind of the way that you know, is that? I would agree with that. And I would take it even a step further. When you first meet someone that you're going to have a relationship with, you have that sense of, oh, that's a quality individual. And obviously you've collected knowledge from your past, but there are many people that have a great resume on whatever social media, but they really aren't great people to date. But the person that when you meet them, you have even a physicality or a sense or your spirit knows something about them from your previous life experience. And also I would say your spirit, but then maybe if you've had a relationship already with them for 10 years, <laughs> there's a whole other bank of knowledge, not only 
do you have that gut sense of them, but you have these experiences with them that prove to you over and over and over that they're a legit person and their presence is really kind of in your bones at that point. And you respond to them with a kind of fluidity. And we all know what this feels like of someone that's family. That is, I believe, the progression of how it is with God. At the very beginning, you have this gut, and that's kind of all that you're going on, plus your previous knowledge of relationships. But as you know a person, you know more and more about what kind of food they like, how they think, what they're going to do when you say this one thing. And I believe God himself actually has those sorts of characteristics that we get to suss out with him and it becomes a very individual beautiful picture because you know there's nobody like drago on the planet and so there's nobody like drago's relationship with god and then when you come forth with your relationship with god to the world everybody gets to see god in the way you see god and that's a wonderful gift so yes and all that other stuff <laughs> yeah i agree with all that but i'll just add one other little quick point that certainly peace is a huge marker but love can have lots of different attributes. As we talked about before, joy, a sense of presence. And also, I like your distinction with the category confusions, because that's, of course, exactly what we're trying to do here today, is clear up the confusion between the categories of spirit and soul. I'm really glad you asked that question for another reason. That is, I was going to put up this slide, but I pitched it because I didn't want to go on too long, but maybe God wanted it addressed because you brought it up. So here it is. And it's basically, I think that what we're talking about is something that's at the core motherboard of reality. People use language all the time, like it's axiomatic or propositional or auto-authenticating. And examples of those would be the law of non-contradiction, certain principles in geometry, like the fact that a point, line, and a plane exist. Assumptions about the scientific method, human rights, ethics, all these things. It just is. It's just so super core that you can't get to it except to just live it and receive it. And that's why I like the word life. It's part of your being. I like what you're saying about life. Another way to protect the spirit in your life is ask yourself, what brings life to me? and to the people around me. So it's always first about the central love life. Drago, did that help? Yeah, no, that, that did help. And I'm thinking if someone didn't want, you know, if there's a barrier where, cause you're right, um, inside out would be like the reprogramming, but if someone that requires someone to assume perhaps on a blind faith initially that maybe there is something there, take the jump. And then they land on something hard, like, oh, wow, I'm glad I took the jump. But can they know before taking the jump? Is there a way to get the knowledge before actually jumping? Or do you just have to jump and then, you know, see what happens? I think that it's so core that we're actually already there and we don't realize it. it. For example, no one has to prove to you that you exist. It's in that space. So it's not like you have to take a leap of faith to know you exist. It's more like trusting what's already there. The psalmist says, taste and see God is good. He's already good. So we're not proving it. We're not working it. We're not making God be good. We're not dancing some type of ceremony in order to get his attention. He already loves us. He's already inside. We're just going, oh, this is reality. What would happen if I acted? Into it. Exactly. And what would happen if I nurtured that plant? Because some of us, our spirits are kind of wilted. like <laughs> <laughs> They've been ignored for a while. <laughs> now, it's not like we have our lives perfectly in order, but we do know that this does bring much more life. So in some ways, it's we're talking about an expanded awareness, an attention, a seeing, which is just a base perception. It's an exercise of perception. Like you said, to I exist, it's just re immediately apparent and it's just opening up that awareness to recognize that. Exactly. And that's why any modality that tries to pull out the calculator to get there is going to leave you still calculating. Yeah, thank you. I just wanted to thank you. Thank you both for your time. It was extremely helpful. Will there be a recording of this later too? To there refer will to? be, yeah. Yes. It'll be on our YouTube channel. Great. Well, much appreciated for the time and the questions you, you tackle. Thanks a lot. 
I think we should probably pray. We're going to do a little prayer here. And the idea of this prayer is to allow Christ to be in charge of your spirit and soul and allow God to be in charge of even this material. Right. Because the temptation will be is like, oh, I have to go back to that slide and think about that. I have to think my way through this. Yeah, maybe the answer is, God, I just allow you to show me what you want to show me from this and I'll ignore the rest. I've definitely had prayer times where I was trying to think my way through a problem and the Lord just basically shouted in my ear, you're not going to get there without asking me first. And I was like, oh. <laughs> it's almost as if God wants to do it with you. Right, right. Okay. Yeah. So I was running hard in my own strength, even in the spirit. Yeah, I was kind of looking around in the spirit, but not really engaging God as, as a dad. Okay, so what you're saying is that it's almost like because God loves you, he's not just this tyrant way out there. He actually wants to connect. That's what I'm saying. Okay. I'm yeah. starting to pick this up. You're getting better. Okay. I want to say two things about the prayer before we start. One of the key prayers is not just God, please, or help, or thank you. There's lots of ways to pray. Those are all great, core, central. But what we notice moves stuff from the supernatural to the natural, from heaven to earth, from God's love to your love as something that manifests is where we actually die to something. We put it in God's hands so that it's like a seed that goes in the ground, as Jesus described, so that God can resurrect the miracle. The cross to the resurrection is the core prayer. So any place where you go, God, it hurts, but I'm going to give you this. It could be a really great sign because you might see something sprout up the next day or maybe right then. We just want to give a few things to God. And I do use the word repent a lot uh, because it's like turning around. Like, I'm sorry, I did it the wrong way. And I want to be clear, although you do sometimes need to repent in a sackcloth and ashes way if you really had a bad attitude with God. But often repent is simply changing your mind with God and letting him be in charge of the thing that you're letting go of. And so that's how we're using it today to let go of that space of being in charge of our own destiny and our own relationship with God and relationship with the spirit. So, God, we bring to you this topic today, and we thank you so much that you're a loving family to us, that the Trinity is a family for us, that we get to connect with Heaven's family in a perfect way, that there are no barriers that you've put up, and that every time that we say yes to you, that you actually come rushing in because you're really waiting at the doorway of our souls waiting for us to give over the things that hurt us to you. And there's really no barrier. You're not holding out on us, but there are places where we think you are. So God, we surrender to you. We repent for the places where we are in charge of our soul. And we believe that we are searching after you more than you're searching after us and where we feel even a sense of separation from you as a loving father or as a nurturing mother or as a brother or a sister. And so, God, we surrender to you our souls and the places in our souls where we have barred the door because it doesn't feel safe or because we've been under the misconception that you don't really want to come to our house and that we have to do a lot of gymnastics in our life to get you to talk to us, or we have to be a super spiritual saint, or we have to make it complicated, or we have to know a lot more than we really do to know your voice. But really, we're just little sheep, and you want the sheep to know your voice even the littlest sheep to know your voice. So God, we repent for the ways that we've been in charge of knowing your voice. And we've been in charge of connecting with you in the spirit and we surrender to you that job. And we allow you into the places where we felt orphaned and alone and like we're in an uphill battle. Where are you anyway? And we repent for that. And God, I ask you by your spirit to bring to mind perhaps one memory or two for people here 
where they perhaps had a kind of damage with their parent or with their sibling that would have damaged their relationship with you. I'd want to ask you to bring that to people's memories and minds right now. I'm going to wait for 20 seconds or so and let God show you maybe a pain that would have made you feel like God is not really out for you, not really banging down your door, but rather you're looking for him and he's nowhere to be found. Huh. I'm getting that scripture that his yoke is easy and his burden is light, that he's not asking you to meet requirement after requirement to hear his voice. And that's kind of what I'm feeling on my head here, almost like a sense of heaviness, like, oh, you need to do this, you need to do that, you need to do the other thing before God will consider you good enough to speak to you. Oof. So this is something you're sensing in the spirit? Yeah, I'm sensing that in the spirit that people might feel like there's lots of requirements to hear God's voice, like there's lots of requirements to get into graduate school. <laughs> hmm. And forgive me and or Zia where we have left that impression like it's got to be super complicated. The whole goal here was to actually try to simplify it in places where we may have been used to the complications. Yeah, so it's really to strip away the complications, even as God actually can explain complicated subjects. Like Jesus does. Yeah. What else are you sensing? That's all, just a sense of people carrying burdens that are maybe a bit heavy, like God's taking you through a maze of complications to get to him when he's saying, I'm right here. There's definitely a maze in the spirit that people, it feels like there's a going through a maze theme. So God, we surrender the maze to you and we surrender the burdens to you. Huh. And we don't want those anymore. We know that you made all the ones here intelligent and smart for a reason, but actually you're smarter than us. So we put you in charge of all the requirements and we come as little children. And we know that your yoke is easy and your burden is light and that you want to speak to us in dreams and in the night whenever we're quiet enough to listen and through our circumstances. And so anybody who got a memory that popped up, God, we ask you to send that memory to heaven and come into it with your presence. And will you show each person here how you're coming in to heal that memory? and how you're coming in to reverse the pain that actually happened. And some people, you know, it happens pretty immediate that they see something that God does to reverse the memory, like they can see, oh, wow, when I was five, that happened with my dad, and so I have to figure things out by myself now. And then they see Jesus coming in and explaining something to them, and they don't have to be alone. Some people it's real immediate and other people take away this memory and invite God into it and even sometimes wrestle with God a little bit over their emotions. So, you know, you can be in either camp and there's no condemnation for either one. It's just however long it takes you. And if you happen to need help, feel free to email us. Yeah, go to uncorkgenius.com. Uh, right. And if you need help to process anything that happened tonight, we're open to help you with that. We appreciate everybody coming out. Thanks for your attendance and contributing and the prayer and everything. Good talk. Thank you, sir. Thanks, Ian. See you, Deborah. All right. Bye, guys. Bye. Thank you again. Yeah. Thank you.